Well, I want to say hi to everybody, especially those of you uh, online or watching on TV. I know some of us uh, as a church fan, we've expanded, and, and it's in the good sense, not like the gravy and mashed potatoes sense. The, uh, we, we are all of multiple states all over, and, it, and it's been awesome to hear stories about uh, what, what Easter meant to many of us, and as we looked at really the central core of what it means to be a Christian. Uh, I want to actually take that and just keep running with that and really talk about something that's important. So to do so, I've got to lead you uh, for a little bit. So if, if you're one who likes to look up the scripture right when I go to it, uh, John chapter 8, I'm going to go there. So for those of you who love to look that, but before we do, I want to talk to you about uh, irreducible minimums. What those are, uh, I was taught this a uh, long, long time ago, actually. Uh, I just had a, had a coach in my life who brought up the idea, and I was like, that sounds brilliant. Irreducible minimums. What it is, is, is it's a list, uh, well, at least in my case, it's a list of things in my life that I have decided that I won't go uh, below. Irreducible minimums, meaning I will never reduce, and when I mean never, I mean, I mean never, I'll never reduce that bare minimum. Let me give you some ideas just so you know what I'm thinking about right now. One is, uh, when I got married, Katie and I talked and, and we resolved that I will always tell her first. Like anything that's like good and worth telling, she's going to get that information first. Uh, she also gets the bad information first, but I'm bringing up the good right now. But she gets that first. It's a priority. It's irreducible minimum. If I hear something new or good or, hey, this happened. First thing, it's, I'm at least if I can't get over texting her. Uh, another example is family ones. Uh, we, we are irreducible minimum is three dinners at home together, looking at each other's faces, no phones, no devices, three dinners, at least irreducible minimum in our home. And our children love it. That's the, okay, so that's another one uh, that we can go a little bit, uh, maybe more spiritual, I guess. I don't know. Uh, early on, Katie and I obviously talked about money. And one of them was that we will never give God less than 10% of our income. Just it, it, sometimes more, but always like 10% 10, 10 is our bare minimum. So that's a whole conversation later. But just want to give you ideas of irreducible minimums. It doesn't matter, frankly, what you suggest to me. Nope, I've already got irreducible minimums. You don't have to have irreducible minimums. That's not why I bring them up. It's a segue. What you do have and you need to think about are irreducible truth. Truths, like irreducible things, things that, that are, are so locked in and, and not changing. Does it matter what anyone else says? It doesn't matter what decade you're in. It doesn't matter what you like, what you're feeling, what emotions are going on at the time. There are truths in life that are irreducible, untouchable. They just are locked in. And what I would tell you is that you should know those, have those, lock on to those, repeat those, memorize those, teach those, it's, and build your life on them. Let me give you where I'm extracting this from. And I told you this is where I was going to go. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, and that's crucial, by the way, to those who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if... And if words can get a bit confrontive, can they not? If uh, you are truly my disciples, if you remain faithful to my teachings, faithful to my teachings. Think about if you've ever wanted to be a Christian, if you are a Christian, according to Jesus, this is not my opinion, uh, you need to be faithful to his teachings and you will know the truth, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Truth. What I would call anything that he taught, anything that he brought up and said, this is true about life, this is good, this is what you ought to do, this is important, those are irreducible truths. Now, we have a problem, just so you know, with truth. I'm going to walk you through this. Issues. Issue one, <laughs> remembering it. A anyone have an issue with this? Uh, uh, we have uh, multiple kids who are... Uh, trying to remember assignments. And I'm like, I didn't have a phone that would buzz me to do certain things at certain times. And I always tell them, like, be grateful, children. Uh, we didn't have that. We had to write stuff down for those of us who actually wrote stuff down, which I was not. Uh, so think about how well you do with remembering. I, let me 
Let, let me show you a, a book. It's, it's a novel. It's not true. It's just a novel story. This is very popular. 100 Years of Solitude. Here's what this novel talks about. It kind of paints this, this storyline of a village who all of a sudden starts to have an insomnia plague. All of a sudden, every, everyone just can't sleep anymore. It's a major issue. Well, then the way the novel unfolds is that then leads to people begin to have like extreme memory loss. So if you read the novel, you're going to learn about all this going on in this village. They can't sleep. Now they can't remember. Well, it hones in on one of the guys in the village named uh, Jose. And he's noticing he can't remember stuff and other people can't remember stuff. He does what I think is the absolute most logical thing to do if you can't remember things. He's like, I have to begin to label them. So the way the story falls is uh, he he begins to literally label the dog uh, with the title dog. You got me? You follow me on this? And uh, he cows, went up to the cow wrote a sign and put it onto the sign, cow. Um, I doubt he had cats, because really, come on, you shouldn't have cats. Uh, anyways, <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Not really, though. Uh, anyways, so and he goes through, he goes through his, uh, his garden, and, and, and he's got stuff there that he labels each one of the, like, this, this is a pepper, right? And, and, and labels the apple tree, this is an apple, and begins to label absolutely everything, which is kind of like, okay, that's how bad the memory loss was happening in this village, and uh, but, but then began, Jose began to realize, I'm not even realizing the point of the cow. I know it's a cow. And so, no joke, here's how, I want to get this right, because this is what, uh, well, it, it, it says, uh, it put this on the cow, uh, a sign. Uh, this is the cow. Uh, she must be milked every morning so that she will produce milk, and the milk must be boiled in order to be mixed with coffee to make coffee and milk. And so that's what's going on in this village. Again, it's all make-believe, but I think it helps us understand. And then eventually, if you don't know this, if you read this, the village begins to put some of the most important things, and one of them, they put a sign at the edge of the village as you enter the village that says, God exists. The memory was leaving. Now, the reason I tell you this is because um, I think you and I have a tendency to forget important truth. I think we, we would say, not right now. No, I won't. That's a big deal to me. But you are probably just like me at many times in your life where you've been like, what was that? And sometimes right now you're going, what was their name? I know their name. That's important to me. They're important to me. But we are consistent at forgetting things that are important. You can lock it in. If I were to remind you about it, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's right. Like, that's a big deal to me. Thanks for reminding me. If you weren't intentional about it, forgetting. But we need to be stewards of it. Truth. Let me get more into the weeds of our culture with an issue with truth. It's what I would call reforming truth. Uh, other words you could maybe use, uh, maybe reshape truth. It's, it's what we have a tendency to do that if you ever learn something that you might call tradition or you might call it like this is the way it used to be, but it doesn't mesh with your emotions and your feelings. You ever been there? Where you're like, maybe even read something in the Bible and you're like, ah, I don't like that about God. I think he might be different nowadays. And so you begin to reform truth because you don't like what you just read or what you heard or what you saw in life. And it's very common nowadays that we are actually taking what is true. And when we don't like it and we don't, we're like, ah, this is, this disrupts the worldview that I want. What we do is rather than say, well, I guess I've got to accept it. We say, no, <clears throat> I'm going to tweak it a little bit. I'm going to get it to mesh a little bit more with what makes me kind of, that's my worldview, my view of God, my view of culture, my view of love, my view of relationships, my view of money, my view of treating others, my view of government, and we begin to tweak it. The problem is, if you take truth and you tweak truth, do you know what you just did? You created something that is no longer true. I know that's not popular, (laughs) but do not forget what Jesus said when I read it to you, that we are to follow what he said to follow, to do what he said to do, and that it is the truth that will set us free. So let me give you wisdom that you already know, but I think sometimes if I put it up on a screen, it helps a little bit. Never build your life on a lie. 
Never build, I mean, you can, you can change the word, I think it's fine. Never build a relationship on a lie. Never build your budget on a lie. Like, in essence, if you build a budget, you do understand that you should start with an accurate n- numbers. Right? Okay, just, just making sure that we know that that's, I mean, like, never build on a lie. And we know that, we get that, that's important. So, all of that needed to be said for me to bring us to now. So, what did Christians, what have Christians for centuries been doing so that culture would not shape truth and reshape it and retune it and reform it to where all of a sudden they're following a bunch of lies? How did they protect themselves? Well, one, there's the Bible. The Bible is a big book. Uh, we're aware. The Bible was written in a different culture than where you and I come from. It was written in a different language than we speak. It was written in a different time than we are. And so when you've got something like that and you begin to open it up with 20, 21 eyes or whatever, sometimes, uh, can, I'll, I'll raise my, sometimes it gets confusing. It gets and, and so sometimes we get this, we get a distance from the Bible and we start to say, well, I want to know truth. I think I know truth. Well, my opinion messed with what I think God's about. We begin to form stuff. Do you know how Christians used to fight this? It's with what's called a creed. It, they would take complex, um, exhaustive parts of the Bible beginning to end and they would compile it into a creed. A creed does not say everything about the Bible. It doesn't say everything about God. It's not like all-inclusive. It's also not like a Harry Potter spell that when you say the creed, all of a sudden something opens, right? But it was designed so that, that no matter what was going on around them, that they would remember what was true, and it would be true, true, not reshaped truth, if that makes sense. Uh, here, original creed is, is a Latin word for I believe. That's what creed means. And so they would create, there's multiple ones, just so you know, lots of them actually, that would just say, I believe, man, I believe, and they would state it and state it and state it and state it. I believe. And this is how all the people before you and I did not screw this thing up. It's, it's how they kept from living a lie is they made sure that they held the truth, carried the truth, valued the truth, and taught the truth through creeds. And one of the most popular creeds is the Apostles' Creed. Now, let me help. Uh, The Apostles did not write the Apostles' Creed. (laughs) Sorry, I know, you're like, oh man. Uh, 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 The Apostles' Creed was was basically uh, written, we believe, in the third or fourth century by folks who had gathered the teaching that the apostles had done a really good job at disseminating all over they, they, wherever they were. They, they were like getting, and so they took those core teachings. What did the apostles say the most? What did the apostles think was the most important? What was the most crucial thing that the apostles locked in? And so they assembled what's called the Apostles' Creed. Now, uh, if, you're, if you've ever heard of any kind of church history, you've probably heard of Martin Luther. Uh, Let me show you what Martin Luther said. Uh, Christian truth could not possibly have been put into a shorter and clearer statement. This is in reference to the the Apostles' Creed. Uh, Don't raise your hands at all on this, but have you ever wished or wondered if the Bible or Christianity could be a little more simple and clear? (laughs) Martin Luther's like, I got something for you. And it's the Apostles' of Creed. So here's what we're going to do for some weeks now. I want to show you the Apostles' Creed, walk you through the Apostles' Creed, and teach you the core beliefs of a follower of Jesus Christ. So that when we get done, the confusion will be gone, the fog will be washed away, and you and I will know that's what it's, the core is really about. So let's go to the very beginning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. This is how they started, okay? So this is a big deal. Do we know? We should know that however you start something, whatever you do first is huge, always. Whatever you do the first part of your day typically says some of the most things that you value the most. And most of us is the snooze button. That's 
a big deal. Uh, but whatever you do first, whatever you do first with your money, your time, your relationships, all that kind of stuff, that is a big deal. That's why I told you earlier, when I get good news, the first person I tell is the most important human being in my life. What you do first is crucial. Never, ever, ever underestimate. When you read in the Bible and it talks about anything first or it says anything first, you lean in extra and be like, oh my, that must be a huge deal. They're copying that kind of approach. So when they start off and say, what should be the first? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. God, that I, I, it makes sense. You're like, well, of course that's, but it is so crucial that you as a follower, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, know about God. Here's another quote. A.W. Tozer said, a church will only be as great as its conception of God. Uh, if you don't dwell on God, think about God, study God, lean in at all to what God said, taught, who he is. If you've never processed uh, even the existence of God, uh, you understand that that is the biggest, most pivotal thing you can do. In fact, can I just deal with something that I think is always apparent anytime I talk about this? Uh, there's two ways to go about this. Um, I believe in God. I don't believe in God. You're like, you went to seminary for that? Listen, listen, listen. When, when we talk about this, I, I understand who's listening. And both groups of people are listening. A group of us believe in God. A group of us are like, I don't believe in God. I just want to point out something. Both require faith. Both require you, and I don't, I'm not hating on, I, both, both require you to fill in some blanks that there are blanks and you're filling them in with what we call faith, meaning you're, you're you could say guessing, you could say believing, but there, there's a faith. You, no one has... No one has been able to successfully locked in, prove that God does not exist. So what I want to bring up, when we talk about what a Christian valued the most, what was so important was uh, God. God's a big deal. God's not only a big deal, he's real. If you want to know, okay, David, how do I begin? I'm going to take baby steps. I want to grow my faith. What do I need to realize? What do I need to lock in? Uh, what, do you, uh, what do you believe about God? Real? or not real. And not only that, let's take this a little bit further. I want to take you into the Bible. Uh, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? This, this, these are questions. Uh, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? The, the writer is trying to give you like big words, big understanding, like who could do such a thing? If you go down to verse 22, uh, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. Some of you get offended by this. Do not, do not get offended by this. It's a description, a poetic description of trying to help you and I understand there is a God, there is a God, there is a God. And this God is mighty. He's the creator of heaven and earth. This is a big deal. It seems so basic, but I don't, I'm not convinced that it's basic. Because if you're anything like me, you've had days where you've at least cried out to God and said, God, I believe in you, but I need you to help <clears throat> with my unbelief in you. And these writers are talking about this guy, this being, this God, there's one, and, and he is mighty. In fact, it, it separates you and I uh, a Christian uh, will deal with this when, when specifically you're walking through stuff that you're struggling with. Uh, it's, it's a big problem or a big question or a big issue or uncertainty. Uh, here's, let, let me show you. you. You either dwell on God's power. This is what, what ancient Christians were doing was when they were walking through life, what they leaned into was not, not their emotions. I'm not discounting emotions. I'm just saying that's not what they went into. Uh, their feelings weren't near as big of a deal. What they, what they reverted to, if you believed in one true God, it was the power of God. It was always about the power of God. Or if you got distracted, it was your problem. 
And many of us, I think, and this is why we bring the creed up, I think many of us are choosing the wrong one here. At least I have at times where I've wrestled with something and, and been more about my problem than God's power. So let me ask you a basic question, but profound, I think. Uh, how big is God? When the creed opens up and says, okay, this is most important, like that I believe in God the Almighty, the creator of, and that's, you know what Bible speak is? It's when the Bible says something, you're like, I don't fully get that. It's like heaven and earth. Whenever the Bible says heaven and earth, it's basically saying <clears throat> everything. You got that? Like abs absolutely everything. He is, he's God Almighty and creator of absolutely everything. How big is the God that you think about, talk to, dwell on, wrestle with? Maybe how big is the God that you're mad at or that you are madly in love with? How big is that God? And let me take you back into the Bible <laughs> and help. I think this helps. The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare. The heavens declare God. They talk about God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. If you need me to help you, creation, what you and I see around us, is communicating that there is an almighty God, a creator, someone bigger and stronger and just powerful and smart. And creative. Wow. Let me take you to the New Testament. If ever since the world was created, uh, people have seen the earth and sky. Just for a second, would you please acknowledge that you would agree with that? Just I, I'm asking if you're watching on time. Yeah, uh, there's been okay. Some of you aren't quite sure that there there, there has been an earth and a sky. Uh, through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. How big is God? I thought of ways to share this with you. Um, the reason that we named this series, this series, we call it High Fidelity. If you don't know what high fidelity is, it's basically fidelity. Let me break it down. Fidelity is, in, is in essence, a decision to be faithful to, to someone or something. It's, it's, fidelity is this example of not only am I committing, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to own that commitment and live that commitment over and over and over and over and over again. High fidelity is just that on, can I say steroids? I don't do steroids, but, but you got me. High fidelity is like hyper focus. I am going to stay faithful to this. And so if you're wrestling with how big is God? How big of a deal is God? Do I believe in God? I want to show you that I think this might help a, a little bit. To, to do so, uh, this is, is planet Earth. You're welcome. Uh, this is planet Earth. And so let me show you something you're familiar with called the sun, okay? So uh, as, you, as you look at the sun, um, I, I want you to understand that you can take, okay, this is earth. Welcome to science class. Uh, you can take this and, and you can fill a school bus with these. And that's how many of these would go into that. You clear on that? I know all of us have seen the sun or been burned by it, whatever. But the sun is, it's, it's a big thing, but we don't typically get as big, we don't understand it. So that's why I want to walk you a little bit further. Let me show you another star, and I hopefully we're aware that these are stars. Uh, Beetlejuice, uh, not the movie, but anyways, uh, Beetlejuice. You can fit uh, 262 trillion Earths in the star we call Beetlejuice. How big is your God? I mean, Earth, we're like, Earth's big, but I know some of us have traveled the world. We're like, you know what? It's kind of a small world. Disney's got its own ride. It's just a small world. I mean, it's not that big. 
But when you and I begin to look at, according to what but the Bible, you want to know the, dire, the directions that the Bible has given us. All we're right now doing is following directions that the Bible has given us. The Bible said, if you want to know that there is a God, a one true God, almighty creator of everything, you got to look at the creation. The creation is going to reveal it. It's actually, science actually proves God. You begin to look at what's going on. And so you got the sun that's big, you got Beetlejuice that's big, let's go even, let's go bigger. Uh, Musifi, not Musafa. But again, now you're just getting into my brain of what I was like in school. Uh, 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 2.7 quadrillion Earths. I mean, come on. Can we all admit we have no idea even what quadrillion is? I mean, we can say, whoa, it is big, but I... Uh, one billion suns can fit inside of this star. N now, let me show you another one because this messed with me, and this was somewhat uh, frustrating. The, the last star that I want to show you, uh, there's, there's Canis Majoris, but, and, and while I was growing up, uh, this was the largest star, Right? This was like, oh, cool. This is this is huge. I can tell you, um, this is this is this only holds uh, seven quadrillion Earths. Only seven quad quadrillion of these. Uh, what's frustrating is we discovered a larger star. <laughs> Isn't that how it works? Like we're like, hey, I think we pretty much got our our pulse on the size of God. And uh, many of us right now go, I know exactly what God is like and who He is and. <laughs> What I love about this is I can preach today and say, hey, this is the largest star. And my guess is within five to 10 years, um, I'm going to have to be like, hey, so uh, there's a larger star. We just found it. Uh, we looked at some data, and I thought this was important. Um, this giant star here, uh, if in an airplane, it would take 1,150 years to fly around this star one time. Like, to, to just to fly, or not to it, just to fly around it. And Oshel should mention that uh, the plane will have to go uh, 10 times faster than the average commercial plane. I mean, that doesn't, I mean, I'm sure there's cooler things I learned in science class that I don't remember. But let me take you back to the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. How big is God? Uh, huge, powerful, and none of these words do it any service. But you know what's cool about God and how big and powerful and sovereign and almighty and creative he is? Years ago, uh, a friend of mine was a, he's, was a car salesman in our area, and uh, he was showing a, an, an elderly woman a vehicle and they got to talk, and he was talkative. And he doesn't care with me saying this. He was talkative. He was a good salesman. And uh, they would talk and talk and talk. And in the midst of talking, she just told him, um, I'm really sad. I mean, just buying a car, but the way this guy was, he, he was just easy to open up to. And, and he's like, uh, oh, uh, tell me more about it. She says, I'm just, she goes, I'm old, and I'm lonely, and I'm just sad. And my buddy uh, loved Jesus quite a bit, and he's like, well, I know, I, I know what you need. You, you need Jesus, and you need a church. And he thought he probably weirded her out by saying that. Um, she did not buy a car that day, but she did come back later on that week and find him at the dealership, and she said, you know what? I want to go on a test drive to that church you talked about. So they got in the car, did a test drive. He drove her to uh, one of our church buildings. Uh, it happened to be open. And the way he is, he's not going to call me up. He's just going to take her on a tour of the church uh, and just talking to her and just talking to her and talking to her. And as they're about to walk out of the building, she actually looks at him again and says, his name was Joey. And she's like, Joey, I'm, 
I'm so lonely. I need help. And he's like, well, I'd like to pray pray with you. He didn't know what, I'd like to pray with you. And so they began to walk out in the parking lot and a car just pulled up and a couple similar in age to her got out of their vehicles and started walking. And the way Joey is, before he prays, he's like, oh, hey, blah, 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 and starts talking to them, right? Good salesman. And so they're just talking and talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. And he's like, what are you guys doing? Like, well, we're here for a small group. And he's like, oh, that's so great. They're like, yeah, we're just starting this brand new small group about loneliness. And it's like, even Joey was like, whoa. God is big. He is mighty. Yet he wants to be involved in your life. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? I think this is a pertinent moment to do this. If you've never, at least in your mind, declared that you believe in God, but maybe you want to. Maybe this is a moment you would say, I want God in my life. I'd like to just take a moment to have this play out. So wherever you are, and if if you want to invite God into your life, it, it can just sound something like this. There's no magic words. God, I want you to come into my life. I believe that you are big and mighty and that you created the heavens and the earth And I believe that you want to be involved in my life. And God, uh, would you come into my life? Would you help me see that you are real each and every day? God, would you walk with me in the great moments and the low moments? God, I invite you into my life. Heavenly Father, I pray for all of us listening. A simple reminder that you are God and you make mountains and oceans and enormous stars and planets and galaxies. And you also inspire people to meet other people so that we can have what we need. And that makes you an amazing God. So we love you and we thank you. In your name, amen.